My favourite thing is the smell of the sea. I'm Patrick Andreas Olstrom and I grew up on the coast where I spent most of my childhood in the sand hunting for treasure. Once I found a message in a bottle from a sailor to his faraway love. I imagine I was him on a ship, a brave adventurer sailing the seas. My first job was working as a clerk for a law firm in the city. I answered phone calls, stamped and filed papers, but I knew there was more of an adventure out there for me. Then I saw the posters, as if they'd been made just for me. A call to serve my country and the British Empire in a great battle abroad. It was 1915, the year following the beginning of the war, and I was 24 years old. When I signed that enlistment paper, I felt as though I was flying. In the blink of an eye, there I was, part of the 32nd Infantry Battalion, dressed head to toe in importance. It was a magnificent send-off. Everyone was so happy. We set sail for Africa, and the journey felt never-ending, as did the rough waters that left the majority of the boys seasick. The days were long and monotonous, so when we spotted a whale or another ship in the distance, everyone would rush to catch a glimpse. The weather warmed up as we neared the equator, and we practiced repelling a submarine attack. The crack of rifles and mechanical engines certainly kept us on our toes. Our last concert on board was swell. It was lit by a bright moon above. That night, we all slept on deck and awoke early to glimpse the mountainous cliffs of northeast Africa. We dropped anchor at Ismailia on the west bank of the Suez Canal. I could barely believe my eyes. The adventure I'd always longed for had finally begun. The place was alive with troops. My first Christmas away from home was a glowing day. We filled our stomachs with Christmas pudding and filled our heads with ideas of what was to come. The following months of training in the sand were as eventful as my days in the office. But we were soon to be where the action was. Our first batch of mail arrived from home. I got six letters and everyone was eager to know the news. Our food rations were not too plentiful and were the cause of much grumbling amongst all. We shared memories of our favourite tucker from back home. Tall tales of football matches, fishing trips and cold beers at the local pub. As the hot Egyptian sand whipped our eyes. The hard work never stopped, but I managed to experience many firsts at the start of my adventure. I rode atop a camel's back. It was a wonky form of transport. It was awfully hot and hard work marching out in full kit up. Water was that scarce that on arrival, one man drank the water that a dozen men had washed in and he said it was good. Then came my first sandstorm. It was awfully funny, but just as annoying. When our job in Egypt was done, we sailed from Alexandria in June, bound for the front lines in France, passing Crete and Malta along the way. We would finally see some real action. We arrived in Marseille, a very fine post, and then it was onwards to Lyon. With most of the French chaps away fighting, there were plenty of girls to make a fuss of us. People went about their daily routines as if there wasn't a war going on, but there was a look of sadness on their faces. In Hasbrook, a town one step closer to the French-Belgium front lines, we were greeted by people leaving church. They brought us fresh milk from their cows and bread still warm from the ovens. The children chased us along the streets as if a circus had come to town. After weeks of work and drizzling rain, I experienced another first, an air raid. Though the Germans were a considerable distance away, it was the cause of much excitement. We wanted Fritz to come closer and have a go at us. We reached the town of Flabay along the river Somme and stationed ourselves at the ruins of a farm where we passed through a night of hell on earth. It was awful. Whilst attacking a German stronghold, the boys took three lines of trenches early, but they couldn't hang on and were soon outnumbered two to one. Many of our men were not yet equipped to deal with trench warfare. They didn't stand a chance. Entire battalions were incapacitated. The noise and the sights and the sounds of the dying men were unending. Every devilish invention was used against us. Liquid fire and mustard gas. This would carry on and off for weeks, periods of silence, and then days of absolute chaos. Soon, the smell of death hung over us like a thick, 
unwashed blanket. Giant black clouds of flies hovered around the bodies that lay motionless in the mud. Rats came in droves and the horrid things never left us. We boiled the water from puddles to make tea in desperation as fresh water supplies had run short. Many of the boys, including myself, contracted the most horrible of illnesses. My first case of dysentery. The nights seemed colder and darker than they ever had before. We were a very sad few, for many of our best pals were lost. I was hospitalised in August 1917 by an angry infection in my arm, which had me transported to the war hospital in New Hampshire, England. It was such a treat to be in clean sheets in a soft bed. I watched it rain heavily from the window as the wounded came in day after day from the Somme. I pitied my poor mates still in the trenches. I was able to take some leave from the hospital and visit town. It was every bit as pretty as France. No wonder Shakespeare loved his Merry England. I experienced my first snowfall and even had my first snowball fight. It was the most fun I'd had in years, but I knew in my heart I had to return to help out my battalion, who had lost more Australian lives in one campaign than in any other so far. As I recovered, I read the newspapers. The Americans were now fighting alongside us, but the Russians had pulled out. In St. Petersburg, the Tsar and his family were dragged from the Winter Palace and executed. The world was in a state of upheaval. By April 1918, I was back in the Somme, alongside the boys, where I was promoted to second lieutenant. The entire battalion looked so much smaller. Of the original 1,000 men who had come here with me, only 200 had survived. In November, we heard of an armistice. The sound of shelling and gunfire had stopped. The voices and laughs of so many of our mates were gone. The journey home was much different to the one coming over. It felt longer, more unsure. When we arrived, none of us were quite who we'd once been. It didn't take long for the fanfare to finish. People were back to their normal lives like nothing had ever happened. I married soon after I turned and went back to my law firm where I became a partner. I played cricket and baseball on the weekends, but many of my nights were still sleepless, filled with cold sweats and nightmares. When I can't sleep and the lingering mustard gas cough won't go away, I'll often go to the beach, thinking of my mates who are lost. I feel the sand and the water against my feet and remember my days exploring the beach as a child, where messages in bottles made me dream of adventure. I'm Patrick Andreas Olstrom, and my favourite thing is still the smell of the sea.